Wir haben äh, gerade geklagt über die Inflation und ob die wieder zurück von 7 auf 2 Prozent geht. In Argentinien hat sie soeben die 100 Prozent Marke überschritten und ist im war im März 104 Prozent laut offiziellen Statistiken. Deswegen hat die Zentralbank jetzt mutig den Zinssatz auf 81 Prozent hochgeschraubt. Es ist ziemlich hart, sich vorzustellen, wie man in so einer Situation eigentlich äh, den Wert des Geldes erhalten soll, wie man überhaupt umgeht äh, mit Geld, was man erhält. Man braucht Alternativen und klassischerweise ist das natürlich der Dollar. Now I wonder, anyhow, Nicolas, um, what do you have physically or in your electronic wallet if you go to Argentina and back home? Please. Thank you. How do you deal, how do you deal with the problem that uh, you need to store value? Well, one option is just leave the country, <laughs> which is happening in big waves. But if you have to go home? Well, uh, if you go home, uh, dollar is king. Dollar is the, yes. is the result. Yeah. Yes, you have what we call a de facto dollarization. People save in dollars, big transactions are nominated in dollars, and maybe they are executed in dollars. And people believe that uh, Thorsten was right, and the dollar will keep its value. Well, certainly more than the peso. <laughs> Well, dollarization or alternatives to it is, uh, is the subject of your talk, so we are uh, eager to listen okay, to it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm uh, really happy to be here. Uh, as I was talking with many of you last night, uh, you remind me of uh, how good friend of Ica, my father, Juan Carlos, was for many years. And I don't know if I told this to Kurt, but the last picture we have of him before his passing was taken right here in Badus during an ICAF conference. And he was wearing a very big smile. So I'm very, very happy to be here today, and I'm uh, very thank you for the invitation. But uh, I have to talk about dollarization, which is one way to control actually much more than inflation. So <clears throat> I'm using 2019 numbers just to leave the COVID years out, but we wouldn't say that Inflation is a big problem for many countries anymore. Uh, the world inflation rate was 4.6%, leaving out liars outside. 70% of world countries had inflation below 3.2%. So we're not talking about a big, big problem. We do have some honorable exceptions. We mentioned one, Argentina, Venezuela, and Zimbabwe. These are 2019 inflation rates. Today, later today, the Argentine inflation rate is coming out again, and that will be more than 140 a year. Uh, we don't know how much, but it's still going up. So we do have a few countries that seem to have the problem out of control, and the topic of dollarization goes into the table again. So why do countries dollarize? There are different reasons. Uh, Panama in Latin America, it was an historical accident. They have been always dollarized since their independence. They never had a central bank. For more than 100 years, they just used the US dollar. Then we have Ecuador, who dollarized in 2000, January 2000. And the reason why Ecuador dollarized was, one, to avoid an hyperinflation. Two, to put an end to two decades of stagnation. They did a big institutional change in their monetary regime. And back then was, we either have hyperinflation or we dollarize. Nothing in between will work. That's what they believe. They dollarize. Then you have El Salvador, which dollarized in 2001 in a fairly good macroeconomic condition, and they dollarized for two reasons. One, to increase or facilitate their economic integration to the US and international trade, lower interest rates, and so on. Another reason, which is an interesting one for countries like Argentina, is have dollarization work as an institutional shield in case a new populist regime takes over and they start to walk away and do their you know, pro-market reforms they were doing back then. So there are different reasons why a country may decide to abandon their currency and adapt a, uh, adopt a foreign, a foreign currency. Dollarization basically is you leave your currency and you start to use some other country currency, the US dollar, the Australian dollar, the New Zealand dollar, the British pound, the Argentine peso. Please don't do that. 
But the point is, you use any other country currency. Now, when you look at countries that have bad inflation problems and weak institutions, dollarization is not only a way to put your inflation under control, it works as an institutional reform. Dollarization is mostly an institutional change, and as such, it will give you a new monetary policy. It works as a commitment device. If you have weak institutions and you cannot be credible, you need to bring credibility somewhere else, and dollarization is, bringing, is giving you that. So, once you finish a process of dollarization, <coughs> changing your currency, this is not done overnight, it takes some time. If you have high inflation, that will go low, it will, like, it will fall to similar US levels. It's an efficient way to control high inflation, but uh, as I want to point out today, dollarization is more than a change in monetary policy. You are changing the institutional framework of the country, you are changing the incentive of the government, you are changing the degrees of freedom. There can be, and you should expect to have, some change in behavior. So, I start to say that today, other than the COVID years, inflation is not a very serious problem. So is dollarization relevant today? And I will say yes. The three countries I just mentioned, Argentina, Venezuela, and Zimbabwe, they are serious conversation, or at least it's on the table, whether or not to dollarize. Zimbabwe was dollarized for 10 years, and then de-dollarized, we came back to Zimbabwe. Now, these three countries are not normal, and I will explain what I mean by that. Uh, but the two points I want to emphasize, other than dollarization being a way to control inflation, is that does dollarization, when you don't have your central bank to finance your deficit, does that impose any fiscal discipline or not? And two, what can we learn a couple of lessons from real world cases of dollarization, Ecuador and Zimbabwe? So this is what I mean that these three countries are not normal. In the horizontal axis, we have, uh, this is for the last 20 years, <coughs> how many times GDP had a negative growth rate. The vertical axis, we have how many times the inflation rate was more than 10%. The three countries I mentioned, over here. They are outliers in a bad way. So these are not countries where their economic situation, economic environment, is like the average countries that will be the blue dots. The three countries that are dollarized in Latin America are down here. Ecuador, El Salvador, and Panama. So if you cannot create credible reforms, if you cannot put forward your credible institutions, it will be very hard for Argentina, which in this table looks similar to Sudan, Angola, and Iran, you will not become Ecuador because you want to. You need a credibility that you cannot create. Dollarization helps you go here. May not be a perfect solution, it's what we call a second best, but might be better than staying up here. We have a very serious problem. The way I try to describe this to my fellow Argentinians is solarization is major surgery for a very complicated patient. In a very bad situation, this might be a way to get you out of that. Okay, so does solarization impose fiscal discipline? So the way I try to uh, break this down is if we have a country with good, high-quality institution, and the government is running a deficit, and that's all the money they're you know, uh, overspending, well, they finance that by issuing treasury bonds. If your, if your institutional uh, framework, the quality is more like medium level, if we want, well, you can issue bonds or you can monetize your deficit. That can lead you to inflation. If you have low-quality institutions, you have this fork here. This is the government with a big fork that will stick it in your asset and flows and expropriate them. Nationalization, expropriation, and so on, they can't get away with that. If you have weak institutions, but you are dollarized, monetization goes in principle away. So you are changing the, <laughs> the degrees of freedom the government has to finance that deficit. And this is why many economists or many individuals say, well, if you dollarize, you are taking that option away that these countries like to use a lot, so they will have to have more fiscal discipline. So how can they not just, if you are here and you dollarize and move here, 
how will they react? What the adjustment may look like? Well, they may try to increase taxes. That has its own limits. It will be costly in electoral terms. You may lose votes. Uh, you are constrained by market limits, like a Laffer curve limit. You increase your taxes, but your revenue doesn't go up. Uh, if you want to issue debt, you have a market constraint. There is only so much debt that the market is willing to take from you. If you are Argentina and you want to issue bonds, good luck with that. Right? Um, you can, if you, if you have the option to monetize your deficit, uh, the constraint you are facing may be more friendly for you. Uh, one limit is, uh, well, if inflation is too high, the real revenue you get starts to go down. So you're not benefiting from this inflation tax anymore. On the limit, you have hyperinflation and your currency situation breaks down. So the limit is much more broader than raising taxes or issuing debt. Um, if you are a good charismatic leader, you may convince your electorate that inflation is because of greedy profits. Anything except the central bank. And if the public believes you, then you may be able to push inflation a little further. And then you have the other options where if you can convince your voters that you're expropriating big evil companies and decide on you, you may be able to go forward and you know, perform some expropriations. If you look at Ecuador, for instance, Rafael Correa, Ecuador is dollarized, he did expropriate some companies. So did the Kirchner in Argentina. Okay. So in theory, um, a country with weak institutions that is dollarized, we cannot tell for sure what will happen with the fiscal balance. It may go down, deficit may go down, it may go up, it may stay the same. Many things can happen. In principle, if, dollars, if uh, monetizing your deficit is a cheaper way to finance your deficit, at least in the margin to some degree, you are creating an incentive to balance your budget. So what do we see when we look at a dollarized country with weak institutions that is dollarized and a weak country, a country with weak institutions that is not dollarized? Do we see a different behavior? This is the deficit in terms of GDP for Argentina and Ecuador. One of the coincidences is that the strong years of populism, or the year with strong populism, start at the same time, 2007. And you can see that the past is very similar those dots on those lines, those are sovereign debt defaults. So on this graph, at least, it doesn't look like Ecuador was constrained on their fiscal deficit because of dollarization. This is the amount of government spending over GDP, and again, we see the same trend at similar levels. So neither in terms of uh, deficit and spending, at least looking at plain data, we don't see much of a difference. So a lesson here is dollarization does not guarantee you fiscal balance. That doesn't mean it doesn't give you other benefits. <clears throat> so if we look at Ecuador first, uh, when they dollarized, it was in early 2000, they were in a political crisis, banking crisis. They were looking at hyperinflation in the face, at this how it's recounted. They were in default. They were facing negative shocks. They dollarize in the worst conditions possible. So if you think that to be able to dollarize, you need to have all these issues fixed, you need to deal with Ecuador. 20 years after, they are still dollarized. The impact of the announcement of dollarization was immediate. The announcement before the law of dollarization put a stop to the bank run, and dollars started to flow back to the banks even if they were having negative real interest rates. Try to achieve that in a troubled country with you know, political instability, a history of inflation, expropriations, and so on. Very unlikely. Inflation goes down pretty quickly. Uh, I will show you a graph in a moment. So ideal conditions to dollarize will be ideal, but not necessary. So this is inflation rate in Ecuador and the US. The blue line is Ecuador. You can see it's high and volatile. They dollarized in January 2000. Because of the conversion rate, they go into dollarization and a few things. Uh, for that year, the inflation rate goes up to almost 100%, and then it just plummets. And it remains low at US levels, 
even during Korea's administration, during the 2008 crisis, another default, real shocks. If you are in Ecuador, you don't worry about what will happen to inflation, the exchange rate. Those are things that they're not even in your mind. When Ecuador defaults in 2008 with Korea, the country risk assigned to Treasury bonds from Ecuador goes up. But the interest rate that were charged to private firms in Ecuador doesn't go up. You separate what happens to the government with the rate you get in the private sector. <clears throat> so dollarization in Ecuador started in 2000. It's still today in place. Rafael Correa was president for 10 years, between 2007 and 2017. He was unable to uh, de-dollarize Ecuador as much as he wanted. There are two things he tried. One is to issue what we will call today a central bank digital currency called Dinero Electronico. So the central bank will issue this Dinero Electronico that will be convertible to US dollars. It was a total failure. No one wanted it, no one used it. It was just discarded as soon as Korea was done. The second thing he did was he mandated the Ecuadorian banks to bring their reserves that were deposited in foreign banks back to Ecuador, put them in the Ecuador Central Bank, and the next thing you do is, hello, Central Bank, give me those dollars, here's a treasury bond. And we'll see when I pay you. So he managed to do that. So even with dollarization, he was to some extent able to if you allow me to use the term, monetize part of the deficit by having access to reserves. Now, when Correa presidency ends, and he's replaced by Lenin Moreno, who was, I think, if I remember this correctly, his vice president, he changed his 180 degrees of policy. A reason for that, he couldn't buy the political coalition just by printing money. In Ecuador, they have political coalitions. You need to keep that as a glue. It's not one political party with a vertical mandate. And you see now Lenny Moreno coming from Korea's presidency, playing nice with the US, the IMF, in a very clear way, because now I have to convince you that I did change my mind. So to convince you, I'm gonna try to put Korea in jail. I mean it when I say, I want your loan. <clears throat> so dollarization does not guarantee you a fiscal balance, but it does impose controls institutional limits to a populist regime. If we look at Zimbabwe, it was dollarized for 10 years, since 2009 to 2019. Uh, in 2008, you may know the famous 500 uh, million bill, which when, the, uh, when it came out, it was equivalent to $2. Uh, in Argentina, the highest denomination bill is equal, I think, to $4. Uh, I may be exaggerating that, I'm not sure. Um, GDP fell 16%. Try to picture that in a country like Zimbabwe, right? It's not that you have a lot of wealth to fall into. Uh, now, when they dollarized, in 2010, the inflation rate was 3%. That's pretty impressive. Again, you don't manage to do that if you keep your central bank. So what, Equa what, what, what Zimbabwe did, they gave legal tender status to the US dollar and the currency of their trade partners, and you can go to a bank and open a bank account in any one of these currencies. <laughs> So this is the data we have for inflation for Zimbabwe, which is the blue line. That will be the hyperinflation. At some point, we don't have data anymore. And when we have to have data again, boom, that's Zimbabwe. Right? Very low to US levels, pretty fast. So how did Zimbabwe de-dollarize? They did manage to do that. Well, you start by issuing a new government money which was called the real-time gross settlement dollar. You set a conversion rate of one new dollar, Zimbabwean dollar, equal one US dollar. Keep it simple for everyone. So if it's one peso, one dollar, well, I can use a peso, it's the same thing, it doesn't matter. The next step, you force a conversion. All your dollars now are Zimbabwean dollars. And the conversion rate is one to one, so it's very easy for you, right? So what happened, the inflation rate went from 10% to 500. Good job. <laughs> um, so, um, dollarization, of course, is effective in quickly getting inflation under control, unless for some reason you want to dollarize and absorb the Argentine peso. But as long as you adapt the currency with low inflation, you're going to converge to that. 
Now, it gives you something else, and I'm thinking of the countries where dollarization is being discussed. Let's say you are the new government in Argentina who will be uh, taking office in December this year. You have to do fiscal reforms, labor reforms, international trade reforms, change of regulation. You have to do a lot of things. And you are taking office with an inflation that is more than 100% going up out of control. How would you going to do those reforms if you don't have some price stability? You don't have the time. You want to cut down your deficit, you need to go to Congress, negotiate a new budget. You manage to bring the deficit down a couple of points. You have to wait another year to negotiate again, make it go down another couple of points. Then you have midterm elections, you're done. You don't have any political capital left to do any reform. If you dollarize and you kill inflation fast, now you have the political space, political capital to move forward with other reforms. The other thing that dollarization gives you is increases the likelihood that you are going to make some adjustments and be expansionary at the same time. You see that in Argentina when they imposed a currency board in the early 1990s. Inflation goes down, GDP goes up. You see that in Ecuador when they dollarize. Inflation goes down, GDP goes up. So they're able to face those reforms without having to go through a downturn in the economy that, as a government, will get in the way of you moving forward with other reforms. So this is one lesson of how dollarization can be a necessary component to do the other reforms. It's not sufficient in the sense that dollarization, of course, is not a replacement for other reforms. And the other lesson is, what's the robustness? Where is that coming from in a dollarized economy? It depends on how you implement dollarization. It's not the same the way it's done in El Salvador, in Ecuador, in Panama, in Zimbabwe. You can think uh, of dollarization as pizza. There are many different ways of pizzas. There's something common to all of them, but you pick the one you like. So one lesson that we see from what happened in Ecuador and El Salvador is that your bank, uh, your bank deposit and reserves, they have to be protected somehow. What becomes very important to protect the currency is the public preference for dollarization. In the 1990s, Argentina had a currency board, which means public were using Argentine pesos. It was like Zimbabwe. It was very easy to get out of the currency board. The convertibility is done. Now your pesos are non-convertible anymore. If you fully dollarize, I need to go on the street and get the dollars out of your pocket and give you something you don't want much more difficult. That's why Korea was en wasn't able to de-dollarize, and Zimbabwe, a less democratic country, was easier for them to do it. Now, if you are a country with weak institutions and you are going to dollarize, the advice will be, after seeing what happened in Ecuador and Zimbabwe, is do it right, shut down, not shut down, shut down the central bank. <laughs> the central bank becomes an unnecessary risk. Once you take away your local currency, all the other things that the central bank does can be done by any other entity. The central bank is the way that Korea and the Zimbabwean government were able to either seize your deposits or reintroduce a currency that led to 500% inflation. If you don't have the central bank and you protect the bank reserves, it's much more harder for a populist regime to walk back from the realization. And I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you have.